In 2021, we went through the History of Modern China series, and to be honest, I made a big mistake. Now, if you enjoyed that series, don't panic, I didn't give you wrong stats or wrong names. I actually did what most history curriculums do and jumped straight from a video on the Great Leap Forward to a video on the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. Why is this an issue, you might ask? Well, the Great Leap Forward ended in 1962 with around 30 million Chinese dead and a total PR disaster for Mao. But the Cultural Revolution wouldn't actually begin until four years later in 1966. That's effectively four years of major policy and personality change in China. And in today's video, I'm going to make the argument that what happened in those four years was exactly what created the Cultural Revolution and led to one of the most impactful events in Chinese history. So stick around to see the Communist Party abandon Maoism, now fill out with his number two, and see some political purges that were even worse than those in the Cultural Revolution. Hello there. So if you don't know much about the Great Leap Forward, I'd firstly recommend checking out this video here, but let's be real, you're too lazy to watch two educational videos in one day, so here's the TLDR. In 1958, Mao completely collectivized the farm so that 25,000 people were working on the one commune with no private market to sell the grain on. Effectively, Mao sent tens of millions of farmers to work in urban factories with the goal of overtaking first the Soviet Union and then Britain's industry. And the communes would have mass produced the crops to feed these workers. Now, for a number of reasons that the video explores, this didn't work and they went through a bad famine with 30 million dying. And so as a result, Mao took a backward step from governing China and in his place, Liu Xiaoqi, Zhou Enlai and Deng Xiaoping took primary responsibility for governing China and they subtly but quickly scrapped the Great Leap reforms. Time to abandon ship. For example, the communes were retained but were dramatically reduced in size with work units being reduced to 30 people. Incentives were also introduced as rural markets were once again allowed to operate. Zhou Enlai also made the decision to authorize grain imports from other countries, which went against Mao's vision for the Chinese peasants to feed the urban factory workers. With this, industrial production increased by 27% from 1963 to 1965, and steel and electricity production was double that of 1957, the year just before the Great Leap. Zhou and Lu also made the call that the urban areas had become too populated and so sent 26 million Chinese who had initially left the farms to work in factories back to the countryside. And Zhou actually went a step further with the overpopulation issue. At a conference in September of 1963, the party aimed to reduce birth rates from 33 births per 1,000 people in a year to just 20. Zhou headed up a propaganda effort promoting late marriage and he even floated the idea of sterilizing husbands after their second baby. The propaganda also extended to work. A combination of no private incentive and the need to preserve energy made many Chinese less productive in the fields. To encourage a greater work ethic, propaganda was built around a worker named Lei Fung. According to the legend, Lei Fung was a hardworking student who helped build China in the factories until he died after being hit in the head aged just 21. And the Chinese were to continue Lei's legacy with hard work. And I will finish what you started. Secondly, the early 1960s were an important period of Chinese history because it was the era in which Mao Zedong fell out with his number two, Liu Xiaoqi. Now, after the Great Leap when Mao was taking a backward step from policy, Liu launched what was called the Socialist Education Movement. Effectively, this movement sought to clean out the Communist Party of all excesses and corruption. After conducting reports that were not even really that extensive, what Liu found was pretty grim. Over 100,000 cases of profiteering had been reported by the public, and in just four cities, 103 million yuan in waste was found. In the province of Qinghai, 47% of cadres were deemed worthy of dismissal, and in Fuzhan, cadres forced peasants to build them houses using communal materials and spent state funds holding endless parties. Now, with Liu heading this investigation and at the same time writing How to Be a Good Communist, which functioned as a Bible to party officials, Mao became wary of Liu. Mao feared China becoming what the Soviet Union had become. Stalin had formerly been the all-powerful leader, but since his death it had become a bureaucracy, with Khrushchev having less power than his predecessor. The first move that Mao made against Liu was in 1964. Liu had contracted tuberculosis, and Mao actually ordered that the Central Bureau of Health stop giving special treatment to the party leadership. Coincidence? I think not! Mao then accused Liu of trying to stop him from intervening in party debates, and extended the criticism to Deng Xiaoping for suggesting he miss meetings to rest with poor health. And things only continued to get worse for Liu. Mao invited him to his 71st birthday, in which he proceeded to yell at and roast his number two in front of everyone. Later, Mao would tell the American journalist Edgar Snow that when Liu denied that there was a capitalist faction within the party, that's when he decided Liu had to go. 
And to replace Liu, Miao gave responsibility to four new people. The first was the new PLA boss Lin Biao, the second was security chief Kang Sheng, the third was media titan Chen Boda, and the fourth was his wife Zhang Qing. And you can actually check out videos we made on Lian Zhang right here. And so the Cultural Revolution is famous for its political purges such as Lu Xiaoqi himself, but before that there were some pretty significant purges which helped create the environment for the Cultural Revolution. With the first purge, Yang Shikun, there wasn't heaps to the story. Effectively, he was fired and replaced by Wang Dongjing, who vetted everyone who came in to see Miao in his office, including his wife, Zhang Qing. The next two are more interesting though. So this guy, Luo Ru Qing, was the former security chief before Kang Sheng, and he presided over China's gulags during the 1950s. Now, Luo made the fatal mistake of supporting the modernization of the military rather than politicizing it to become an arm of Mao Zedong that specialized in guerrilla warfare. He also made the fatal mistake of criticizing his boss, Lin Biao, who was head of the army, for sucking up to Mao. As a result, Lin's wife accused Luo of trying to take Lin's job, and a Politburo meeting was held in Shanghai to try him. A dossier had been compiled against him, but Lu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping found nothing treacherous in Luo's conduct, and the tribunal wasn't keen to convict him. However, Luo buckled under the pressure of being an enemy of Mao, and offered his resignation and offered self-criticism, a practice where Mao's enemies were made to publicly confess their sins. Luo also had to face a shame session, where party officials would harass and lecture the wrongdoer about their mistake. In Luo's session, 95 people were in his face. Of those were actually Zhou and Lai and Deng Xiaoping, who did the maths and came to the conclusion that Luo wasn't worth sticking their necks out for. The atmosphere in the shame session was actually so volatile that Luo jumped out of the three-story building, breaking his legs. His suicide attempt was taken as proof of guilt. Finally, Peng Zhen was also purged. Now, there's a lot of names here, so go slow and repeat this if you need to. Peng Zhen was the boss of Beijing and was also the Minister of Culture. Basically, the deputy mayor of Beijing, Wu Han, wrote a play about Ha Rui, a Chinese court official who stood up to the Ming Emperor in the 1500s. Now, in 1959, Mao actually praised Ha Rui for his bravery, but since then, Mao's former chief of the PLA, Peng Dehuai, had criticized Mao. In the same way that Ha Rui had stood up to the Emperor, Peng Dehuai was being praised for standing up to Mao, and so now Mao strongly opposed any works on Ha Rui being published, as it was seen as an attack on him. And so this is where his new gang came into play. Zhang Qing got Shanghai newspapers to publish an article saying that Wuhan's play had spread like poison and that it encouraged capitalism. But given that Wuhan was deputy mayor of Beijing and Peng Zhen was the boss of Beijing, Peng wasn't willing to give up his man. Because he was the boss of the nation's capital, Peng had the authority to direct the People's Daily, the Communist Party's national newspaper, and he ordered that they run an article expressing the need for freedom to criticize. And while Peng's loyalty was commendable, it sealed his fate in the Communist Party. At a party session that Deng Xiaoping chaired, he was found guilty of contravening Mao Zedong's thought and sentenced to life in prison under house arrest. So Deng Xiaoping and Zhou Enlai were clearly not fans of Mao Zedong's thought. During the early 1960s, Zhou completely scaled back the Great Leap Forward, while in the 1980s, Deng would go on to establish his own Deng Xiaoping thought. So why go along with the purge of Luo Ruqing, who they found no wrongdoing with, and Peng Zhen, who they probably agreed with? Well, Deng and Zhou were not in the business of being heroes. While Peng's defense of Wuhan was admirable and very noble, his sacrifice did little for the direction of the party. If Deng and Zhou were to give up their political lives, then Mao's sycophants were destined to fill that void. And if Deng especially stuck his head out at that exact moment, Hua Guofeng would have probably been the leader of China after Mao's death, and the modern PRC could have much more closely resembled North Korea. Thanks for watching. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to hit the like button so that YouTube knows to share it with other people too. Subscribe if you haven't already, with 35% towards our Chinese history podcast, and if you disagreed with my closing analysis, let me know why below. I may have taken it too far. We can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.